Where does evil come from? Ernest Becker's last book, Escape from Evil, is a piercing psychological analysis of human aggression. The book provides a sweeping historical perspective, beginning with man's evolutionary origins as a single-cell organism, continuing through primitive society, organized religion, the invention of money, going all the way to the Nazi and communist ideologies of the 20th century. With the help of post-Freudian psychology, Becker gets to the heart of how exactly evil works. He also gives us an explanation of why man-made destruction has only grown in magnitude with the rapid development of our species. Here I will read a few short passages from the book. These summarize Becker's argument about the origin of human evil. I will also provide some of my own commentary for added clarity. Becker begins with the simple fact that all creatures desire life and evade death. He writes, All organisms want to perpetuate themselves, continue to experience and to live. It is a great mystery that we don't understand, but observe every day. We are amazed as we try to club a cornered rat, how frantically he wants to live. All animals are this frantic, without even knowing what death means. They probably only sense the danger of crushing opposing power. For all organisms then, opposing and obliterating power is evil. It threatens to stop experience. But men are truly sorry creatures, because they have made death conscious. They can see evil in anything that wounds them, causes ill health, or even deprives them of pleasure. Consciousness means too that they have to be preoccupied with evil, even in the absence of any immediate danger. The result is one of the great tragedies of human existence, what we might call the need to fetishize evil, to locate the threat to life in some special places where it can be placated and controlled. It is tragic precisely because it is sometimes very arbitrary. Men make fantasies about evil, see it in the wrong places and destroy themselves and others by uselessly trashing about. Becker explains that since man is conscious of death, this makes him the most vulnerable of all animals. Most vulnerable not because of any physical disadvantage, but because man alone, of all species, understands his vulnerability. He lives with it knowingly. Our self-awareness makes every corner of the universe a potential death trap. We know our life can end at any moment. This existential dread would have crushed us had we not developed, through millennia of psychological evolution, ways to reduce the cosmic evil we perceive into smaller, more manageable forms. This is the origin of scapegoating, choosing one arbitrary object as the embodiment of all evil. We pick out a scapegoat and then ritually destroy it. We feel like we're destroying evil itself, for a time, our existential dread subsides. We actually observe this in primitive ritual, as Becker writes. In one of its forms, scapegoating is also magical in origin. A ritual is performed over a goat, by which all the tribe's uncleanliness, or sin, is transferred to the animal. It is then driven off or killed, leaving the village clean. Scapegoating might seem like an oddity of our religious history, However, it is much more relevant to each one of us today than it might seem. In fact, it is the universal reflex of the human mind. The great psychologist Carl Jung called it shadow projection. By this he meant the act of refusing to face the darker elements within ourselves and unconsciously projecting them onto other people. Becker writes, as Jung put it, the shadow becomes a dark thing in one's own psyche, an inferiority which nonetheless really exists even though only dimly suspected. The person wants to get away from this inferiority, naturally. He wants to jump over his shadow. The most direct way of doing this is by looking for everything dark, inferior and culpable in others. Now, we can see how shadow projection is just like primitive scapegoating, only brought to the personal, psychological level. It goes like this. I am a dishonest man, but I do not want to face this fact. Therefore, I go around calling everyone a liar, a cheat, a fraud. 
I cannot deal with my own dishonest nature, and this frightens me. Therefore, I project it outside, and defeat its imaginary projection with my indignation. This makes me feel I have overcome that within me, which I am actually too frightened to face. Had this process been strictly personal, the damage it created in the world would probably have been negligible. However, Becker points out, shadow projection scales up as people gather together. Then it becomes a social, national, even a cultural phenomenon. While once sacrificing a goat to the gods was enough to protect the people from existential dread, today's massive groupings of people require far greater sacrifices. The Nazi Holocaust is one horrifying example of what happens when a whole nation projects its shadow on an ethnic minority. Becker points out all political scapegoating is essentially a religious ritual. It is the act of embodying all the evil in the world and all the injustice in the state onto one easily discernible object. An object that then must be destroyed so as to destroy the evil it symbolizes. We read, With the coming of the state began mankind's real woes. The new class society of conquerors and slaves right away had its own internal frictions. What better way to siphon them off than by directing the energies of the masses outward toward an alien enemy? The state had its own built-in wisdom. It solved its ponderous internal problems of social injustice by making justice a matter of triumph over an external enemy. This was the start of the large-scale scapegoating that has consumed such mountains of lives down through history and continues to do so today right up to Vietnam and Bangladesh. Popular hatred for the ruling classes was cleverly diverted into a happy occasion to mutilate or kill foreign enemies. In short, the oppressor and the oppressed, instead of fighting it out within the ancient city, directed their aggression toward a common goal an attack on a rival city. Thus, the greater the tension and the harsher the daily repressions of civilization, the more useful war became as a safety valve. But to say war and scapegoating are a safety valve for the internal conflicts of the state only goes so far. The root of evil, Becker reminds us, is in the tragedy of the human condition. It is the tragedy that humans alone of all animals know we are animals. We know we are going to die, and as Becker points out, it is our instinct, it is in our source code to want to evade death, to evade the animal within us. It is our inner animal that is our deepest shadow, and like Jung explained, we go around projecting our shadow in small and big ways. The small ways can be really small, but the big ways, they can be really big. Holocaust big, race war big, genocide big. Every time we point the finger at a nation, a people, a community, every time we say it's them, they are the problem, we are effectively scapegoating, we are projecting our shadow, we are turning others into the animals we are too frightened to admit we ourselves are. The terrifying conclusion of Becker's last book is this, human evil really is human evil. This leaves us much food for thought. Not least of all, it reminds us that every time we point the finger at someone and say, you are the problem, we are effectively under the same spell that has motivated every genocide in human history. We are throwing all the incomprehensible danger of the world and all the inferiority we feel in ourselves onto another, a scapegoat. This is where evil comes from. All the rest, literally, is bloody history. Thank you for watching. These were Becker's ideas, but what are yours? Do you agree with his interpretation of evil? Let us know in the comments. Also, if you'd like a deeper dive into Becker's escape from evil, make sure to check out our two last videos. There we go in depth into Becker's interpretation of both gift giving and the economy as forms of religious ritual. If you enjoy this kind of content, make sure to subscribe to the Seeker to Seeker channel and stay tuned for more. And remember Rumi's words, what you seek is seeking you. See you next time.